Christmas. Yeah. Backpack stand. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, we're gonna hang out at Shop's house. <laughs> 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 All right, y'all stand up. <laughs> I can't let Christmas go yet. We actually still have one more Christmas to do with Trevor's family there in the uh, Nashville area. So it's not over in my mind. There's still another chance to do everything I want. that you were born we thank you that you were born to die for our sins father we give this service to you we thank you for a season where we can lift you up where we can honor you and and sing glory to you father for you are glorious you are worthy and we love you today thank you for being here with us thank you for inhabiting our praise this morning we love you it is in your son's precious name we pray amen he is good isn't he even if you didn't get everything you wanted for christmas God's good no matter. We can have the worst day ever, but we can always say that the Lord is good and He is good forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Oh, Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you're good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Do you believe that today? 
Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. We worship you. of mine in 2018 to say more often, God is good. Because if we proclaim it, it's not for him. It's for us. Sometimes we have trouble separating those crummy things that happen to us every day. Or that one terrible thing that week that happened. Sometimes we have trouble focusing on the fact that God is good. And his mercy is there for us every single day. And we choose to look at the yucky stuff. So if we proclaim with our mouth, you know what, God, you are good. You are holy. Our focus is going to change. So let me, let me just challenge you in 2018. 
first thing out of your mouth, God, God is good. God is good every morning. And remind yourself of that. It's hard to do, I know, trust me. But if we try more often to remind ourselves of all the good things and all the things that God has promised us in his word, we will begin to dwell on what a beautiful savior he is. We begin to dwell on his word and his promise and, and his love. And I know we could all use more of that. What a wonderful name it is. Could not hold.
That's good news. Amen. We had an incredible offering last week. You guys get what I'm getting ready to read to you right here in Luke chapter 6. And Jesus is talking. He says, Give and you will receive, verse 38. The gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you give back. And because of your generosity, I found out something. I was off on Friday. We got an email from Rhonda. She does uh, our administrative assistant job here at the church. And she said, we started the year off owing $357,000 somewhere on our building. Guess what? That's below two hundred and fifty now because of your faithful giving. So yeah, give, give God a hand clap. Don't quote me, I'll say somewhere around 225, somewhere in there is what we owe. So I believe in 2018, we'll pay this bill off and we'll have no more debt, amen. But I get to bring my tithe today because we got paid Tuesday. So that's a good good thing that we get to worship God and return what he's given, just a portion of what he's given us back to him. So let me pray for our offering. Father God, we just thank you for this day. I thank you for your, your faithfulness, for how you bless us. You take care of every need. And God, I just pray that you continue to move hearts, to move the givers, God, that they will be obedient. They'll bring the full time and they'll bring offerings to this church, God, that we'll be able to be debt free in 2018 and we'll go forth even freer to share the gospel and reach out to those that are in this surrounding area to tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
How's my two favorite people? Bye. Hey. What's this? You weren't here when I came here, so I left the note. This is our special bench. Grandpa, remember our deal? Now, oh, just a second, Princess. Wow. See what that is for me, will you, Princess? You have a text message from a friend named Carl in Germany. It says, Ich versprach sie für... Uh, it says, Ich versprach sie für viele Jahre und zum Besuchen. And ich komme morgen. <laughs> Y'all don't understand that? No. He's been promising for years to come visit. He's coming tomorrow. Wow, and finally, he always said he was going to be coming. Wow, that's so cool. What is it, Grandpa? Well, I'm just kind of thinking that you here in a foreign language just sort of reminds me of something. There's another gift of the Spirit, and that's speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit gives us this ability to speak in a way only God can understand. And sometimes other people will be given a gift to know what that means and interpret it for us. It's like the gift of speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues. And it's kind of like hearing a foreign language. Like when you promised for us to go fishing. Well, that's, that's more like a prophecy. That's more like a prediction of the future, of things that will come. More than a promise, actually, it's sort of a sort of a prediction. It's kind of what God told someone was going to happen, and then it does. Kind of like fishing, I guess. I mean, we said it had happened, and now today it's going to. Grandpa, remember the deal? Oh, yeah, I remember the deal. 
So my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues. First Corinthians 14:39. Boy, you sure picked a good one on that one, Princess. Good job. Grandpa, I want in on this deal. Okay, but in the meantime, I think we better go fishing before all the fish quit biting. There's a limit on that. All right, come on, let's go fishing. But let's Grandpa. Go. Amen. Brother Ed, yeah, let, give him a hand clap there. Brother Ed is in here. We have some movie stars here in this church, don't we? They do a great job, although Ed is outclassed there by those two cuties, no doubt about it. Of course, Ashley and I were a little biased there about them, but uh, thank you for being here. This is the conclusion of Gifts, week five, and we are going to be on the spooky topic of tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophecy. Are you all scared? Are you shaking? I want you to look at the person on your right of you, and I want you to say, are you going to speak in tongues today? Then I want you to look at the person on your left and say, if they speak in tongues today, you have to interpret. <laughs> no, what we want to do, we want to take the spookiness out of this. We want you to understand that these gifts are in the Bible. We're going to talk about what Paul teaches us about gifts in 1 Corinthians 14, of, uh, of uh, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. And we're going to look and see what the United Methodist Church believes about these gifts. And we just want to take it down to a basic level where you can start to think about, if you haven't already, what you believe about this, where you can get into the Word of God yourselves, and you can research this, and you can pray about it, and you can see what the Holy Spirit himself, who gives us these gifts, has to tell you about that. But you know, I was raised Baptist, and Baptists normally don't believe in the gifts of tongues, but I heard this story this week that I thought was pretty interesting about this Baptist church, and it was the last night of a revival in the Baptist church. After the service was over, many had already left, but there was a few who gathered in the back of the church to see a woman who was speaking in tongues. The pastor walked back to see what was going on. He listened to the woman for a few minutes, and then he shouted, praise the Lord. The deacons around him were amazed. They were scratching their head. They asked the pastor, what is going on? He told them that this woman has a gift of tongues, and he has the gift of interpretation of tongues. He said that God had said this lady will give this church $10,000. She never came back. <laughs> It's pretty good, isn't it? I like that. But we're looking at these nine gifts plus love. I think they may have those to put on the screen. This is the groupings. Wisdom, knowledge, and discernment. We've got faith, healing, and miracles. Last week was love. And then this week, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. If you missed any of these uh, past sermons, you can go back online on our webpage. You can go to our Facebook page. You can dial those up unless we've had technical difficulties, the service in its entirety is there. But this is an introduction to these gifts today, and like I said, I have studied the gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues for years. This is not something that we're going to be able to uh, decide today. I'm not going to be able to convince anybody one way or the other. As a matter of fact, I'm going to refrain from even giving you my opinion about this and what I believe. What I want you to do is seek God. I want you to get into the Word, have an open mind and an open heart, and I want you to look at the umc.org website. I want you to go in and just for yourself flesh this out and see what God teaches you about these gifts. So what do Methodists believe about tongues? I started to research this and I thought, what do we as a denomination believe? And I'm from their webpage. You can look it up. It says, the gift of tongues is a communication gift that allows people to speak foreign languages and convey concepts they never formally studied. People with this gift pick up the ability to communicate across barriers of language, culture, age, or physical limitation. Some people with the gift of tongues work with the deaf or blind. The identification of the gift of tongues as a secret prayer language is often misunderstood, and an individual manifesting the gift in this way must always be paired with someone who has the gift of interpretation of tongues. These gifts are given for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. So we know what our denomination believes. What does Paul teach us? In 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 through 4, let's get into the Word of God, the New Living Translation, and let's see what the Apostle Paul tells us. And this whole chapter, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you, but go home, research this, dig a little bit deeper, take your notes home, and meditate on it in your quiet time, and see what God reveals to you. Let love be your highest goal. 
but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But the one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. And I love the way Paul did this. I love the way he did 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 13, and 1 Corinthians 14. Because your first point today is we go back to what is the most important. Love is the highest goal for us as Christians. Whether you believe in tongues, whether you're a cessationalist and you believe that those gifts have passed away, or whether you still believe that there is this gift of tongues that the Holy Spirit speaks a language through you that can be interpreted if it's for building up the church, or whether it's a prayer language that may be personal between you and God that you have for self-edification and for building up your spirit. Whatever that may be, it doesn't really matter if you're on this end of the spectrum or if you're on that end of the spectrum. But we need to love each other. We need to love this lost and dying world that's out there that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, Wesley always talked about the essentials, and he talked about the non-essentials. And we should have love in everything, no matter what, no matter what your belief is. We're going to have the essentials of Jesus Christ, him crucified, that he bled and he died and he paid our sin debt. And then he arose, and he's alive today, and he is God. We're not going to compromise on those things, but on these other beliefs, they may be non-essential. But love is something that is essential. Love is essential for us as a church, for us as, as family, for parents, for spouses, for uh, working relationships, bosses, for employees, whatever. We have to show love. We will speak truth, but we're going to speak it in love. And then number two, your second point today, when praying in tongues, you are talking to God for your strength. Paul is talking about that in this chapter. And I believe there is a prayer language, praying versus speaking. If someone stood up in here today and they started speaking in an unknown language that none of us know, someone would have to interpret that or it would be out of order. It would be something that is not of God. And that's what Paul talks about in here. But there, is, there are times that he's talking about praying. He's not talking about speaking. He's talking about praying, and that's a time that is a personal relationship that you work on your prayer time with God if you have this gift. Um, he says that someone talking in tongues this way is speaking a language that only God can understand. It's mysterious to humans. So therefore, that's different than if someone stood up in the church service and said something that was for the building up and the edification of the church that would have to be interpreted. Let's look at Paul's language here in 1 Corinthians 14, 13 through 17. So anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the spirit, and I will also sing in words I understand. For if you praise God only in the Spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you are saying? You will be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. And your third point today, we've already sort of covered this, speaking in tongues is for building up the church, and it must be interpreted. But prayer is often very personal. Now, what we're going to do in a few moments at the end of this service is going to be corporate. And I'm going to ask each and every one of you, you don't have to, I'm not going to make you, we're not going to have people at the back with sticks pushing you forward, but I believe at the end of this service, when I tell you what I'm going to tell you, you're going to want to come forward and you're going to be a part of this prayer, and it's going to be a corporate prayer. And it's not for me, and it's really not even for you. It's for a certain situation that you're going to want to pray for, I guarantee, and you're going to be glad that you're not the one needing this prayer. So just get ready for that. Touch the person beside you. Say, it's okay. I'll walk with you. It's okay. We'll come down together. But anyway, we want to do things personally. We want to do things decently and in order in everything that we do in a church environment. Because like Paul says, if you're in here and every one of you started saying weird things or praying in tongues and nobody could understand and you all tried to talk at one time, if someone that was not a believer came in here, what would they think? 
they would think these people are nuts. They wouldn't understand what is going on. That's not going to lead anyone to that love of Jesus Christ. So that is something that you never want to see happen. You want things done decently and in order. Romans 8.26 tells us a little bit more about praying in the Spirit also. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Paul teaches us at times that there are times that we pray we simply don't know what to say. We simply don't know what in the world that we should even ask for. Sometimes we have that kind of pain, and I pray that you never have that kind of pain in your life, that you never have that kind of a groaning where you're just falling apart, that you don't even know what to say, that if you even tried to say it, you can't get the words to come out of your mouth. And if you've ever had that kind of pain, you understand what I'm talking about. You understand that kind of travail when you're just crying out to God. I've been in those situations. I've been, as a pastor, walked into the emergency room where a dear friend of mine, and uh, he's laying there, his toddler is laying there deceased, and he's just crying out to God. And I, I'm overwhelmed, and he's overwhelmed, and everybody in that situation is overwhelmed, and pretty soon our whole church family is around us overwhelmed. And folks, there's just not one thing I can say in that situation to make that father and make that mother feel any better when that, that baby's laying there and has no life. So there are times that we have to just cry out, and we have to trust our spirit to say the things that we don't know what to say. In that situation, the best thing we can do not try to give an answer. There's nothing that we can say that's going to give comfort to that person at that time. We just have to be there. We have to share that love, going back to the first point today, the love, and being there for one another to be able to help carry that unfathomable burden that none of us ever wants to feel. And if you've ever had that kind of a loss in your life, you understand. But there are times that we just don't have it all together. We don't have the answers. And it's really a, a terrible time in ministry where all you can do is just love somebody and walk with them through the pain, through the heartache, through everything that is going on in their lives. And I don't know what your plans are for the new year, but I always like to start the new year off for the past few years with a 21-day fast. And I'm going to be doing that. We're going to start a new series called Discipline next week. I'm going to be talking about fasting. If you want to learn more about fasting, why to fast, how to fast, what to do, if you want to learn more about that, if you would like to join me in prayer and praying for our church, praying for situations, maybe you need a breakthrough. Well, that's when we're going to start that next week, and I start my fast tomorrow. So I encourage you, if you want to join me on that, that's a, that's a good thing to do to get yourself focused on God and your relationship with him and maybe something that you meet, need from God, that you need a breakthrough for a family member, you need a breakthrough for yourself financially, relationally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, whatever it may be. I encourage you to go on that journey and at least uh, have an open mind about it. I know as Methodists, we don't do a lot of fasting around here, I've noticed. Where two or more Methodists are gathered, the chicken must die, and the chicken must die quickly, right? That's what I've, that's what I've heard, and it's been a good thing, but I'm going to deny myself for that for 21 days over the first of the year and start 2018 outright. So let's look at prophecy just a little bit. What is prophecy? Uh, the definition of that is a prediction, an inspired utterance of a prophet. Uh, what is a prophet? One gifted with more than ordinary spiritual and moral insight, an effective or leading spokesman for a cause, a doctrine, or a group. Um, the gift of prophecy would be that someone is able to stand up here and tell you what's going to happen in the future, not because they do anything mystical. It's because God speaks through them and says, I want you to say this, thus saith the Lord. We don't see a lot of that in America anymore, do we? We need some prophets to stand up and to prophesy the truth of the Word of God, and that's what I attempt to do is, is to preach and teach this, and that's a little bit prophetic, but it's not a, a prophecy as far as telling the future. As this old world rolls along, as we get into the book of Revelation, if we're still here and we don't get raptured out to, to be with Jesus and we go through this tribulation period, a lot of us who know Revelation will be able to stand up here and will look like prophets because we'll be able to tell you, okay, this happened, the Antichrist did this, this is next. And this is going to happen next. And that, those kinds of things will look pretty prophetic, but it's really just uh, understanding the Word of God and teaching people what is coming. 1 Corinthians 14, 5 says what Paul tells us about prophets. I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues, unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church 
will be strengthened. And your fourth point today, the gift of prophecy is greater than that of tongues because it builds up the entire church. And that's what we should be about. You may not be a prophet. You may never utter a prophecy. God may never reveal anything to you to tell someone else that's going to happen in the future. You may never speak in a tongue. You may never pray in a tongue. You may never uh, have that kind of gift, and that's okay. The Holy Spirit gives us our giftings. Don't put that kind of pressure on yourself and think, oh, I've got to do this or I've got to do that. We don't do anything. All we have to do is be obedient. And when we grow up and we get into this, that's where you're going to understand your giftings. That's where you're going to see your gifts come out, and they're going to be utilized for the kingdom of God, and you're going to be able to build up and edify others and build up the church because that should be what we're doing as Christians. We should be building up each other. We should be building up and encouraging the church. We should be reaching out to the community and being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. That's why we have these gifts. That's why this series for us to open our gifts, just like we open gifts for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We want to open these gifts that are inside of us, and we have to grow beyond the milk of the word and get into the meat of the word, as Paul says, so that we can understand more about these things. We don't want to be childish. So that's why I'm teaching on this subject. 1 Corinthians 14, 18 through 20 tells us, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you, Paul says, but in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil, but be mature in understanding matters of this kind. And to be honest, I've, I've been a Christian a long time, probably 30 years or more, but I don't remember ever hearing a whole lot of preaching on this subject, on the gifts of the Spirit, and teaching on these kinds of things. And people tend to stay away from tongues because they're spooky. And speaking in tongues and, and praying in tongues and prophecy, people tend to get wigged out about that. But I don't want you to be wigged out. I want you just to grow in your understanding. I want you to seek God. I want you to look for what is truth. Mankind can get out here. We can mess it up. We can have a lot of flesh. We can say, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. And that's a clue. If somebody's trying to make everybody look at them and they're not pointing to him, then you can understand it's probably of the, it's not of the spirit. It's going to be of the flesh. But if they're pointing to God, if somebody, if somebody actually stood up in here, I've only seen it done one time in my life in a church. Somebody sitting behind me spoke in tongues. There was a pause. And then somebody sitting over to my right side to the front interpreted what was said. And the leadership of the church all gathered around, and it was received, and it was done decently, and it was done in order. But I've only seen that done one time in my lifetime in being in church, and I've been in church since I was a little bitty fella. So I've not seen it done very often, but it is a gift that's in the Bible that could happen. If you want to dig a little bit deeper, there are some good books on this subject. Robert Morris the God I Never Knew is a really good book. If you'd like to read that, that uh, can allow you to dig a little bit deeper, keep your mind open, and listen to what he has to say about some things. There are some terms in there like baptism of the Holy Spirit that I'm not sure I've totally worked out my whole uh, theology on and, and that subject and researching some things. There are different beliefs depending upon whether it's cessationists or whether they're second or third wave or whatever their beliefs may be, um, the vineyard beliefs and whatnot. Some people think that you're saved, and I think everyone agrees that once you're saved, the Holy Spirit indwells you at that moment of salvation. But some people believe there's a subsequent filling of the Holy Spirit, and they call that a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure where I fall on all of that. I believe that you've got all of God inside of you once you're saved. I believe that you do have the Holy Spirit inside of you. But I do believe we can mature. I believe that we can grow in our giftings and our abilities. And you're not going to do that apart from this. You've got to be in here. You've got to understand it. You've got to get off the milk of the word and get into the meat of the word. From our website again, from the United Methodist Church, uh, just give you some guidelines about what they, uh, what they say about this. And I think this is really good. I know it's long, but I want to read this to you. You can go research it yourselves as well. But this is really good if we will follow this in every aspect of these gifts. They say, we believe the church needs to pray for a sensitivity to be aware of and to respond to manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our world today. We are mindful that the problems of discerning between the true and the fraudulent are considerable, the flesh that I'm talking about, but we must not allow the problems to paralyze our awareness of the Spirit's presence, nor should we permit our fear of the unknown and the unfamiliar to close our minds, 
against being surprised by grace. It's good to be surprised by grace, isn't it? Amen. We were surprised by grace at our salvation, that amazing grace. We could use more of that, more grace in our lives. We know the misuse of mystical experiences is an ever-present possibility, but that is no reason to deny spiritual experiences. And facing the issues raised by charismatic experiences, we plead for a spirit of openness and love. We commend to the attention of the church the affirmations of Paul on the importance of love in 1 Corinthians 13 and of Wesley in essentials unity and non-essentials liberty in all things charity. Love that cares and understands, without an active, calm, objective, and loving understanding of the religious experience of others. However different from one's own, harmony is impossible. The criteria by which we understand another's religious experience must include its compatibility with the mind and the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, as revealed in the New Testament. It's always going to be backed up here. If the consequence and quality of a reported encounter with the Holy Spirit leads to self-righteousness, hostility, and exaggerated claims of knowledge and power, we all love that, don't we? I'm better than you. No, we don't want that. Then the experience is subject to serious question. However, when the experience clearly results in a new dimensions of love, faith, joy, and blessings to others, we must conclude that this is what the Lord hath done and offer God our praise. You shall know them by their fruits, Matthew 7, 20. And there's much more on this website. If you dig in and you say, I really want to know what we believe, we're United Methodists, you know, don't take my word for it. Go in there. You can dig deeper. It's a lot longer than what I clipped out here to share with you. But they've got guidelines for all. They've got about nine guidelines. And I'm going to wrap this up pretty quickly today because somebody told me the Lady Vols are playing at noon. And I guess that's important. So I've got to get us, get, us, get us done here. i just got a few minutes. Number one, be open and accepting of those whose Christian experiences differ from your own. That's a good guideline. Continually undergird and envelop all discussions, conferences, meetings, and persons in prayer. Be open to new ways in which God, by the Spirit, may be speaking to the church. Seek the gifts of the Spirit that enrich your life and your ministry as well as the life of the church. Recognize that all those spiritual gifts may be abused in the same way that acknowledge or wealth or power may be abused. This does not mean they should be prohibited. And number six, remember that like other movements in church history, the charismatic renewal has a valid contribution to make to the ecumenical church. Number seven, remember the lessons of church history, that when God's people rediscovered old truths, uh, the process was often disquieting, and that it usually involved upheaval, change, and a degree of suffering and misunderstanding. Always be mindful of spiritual needs of the whole congregation. And number nine, in witnessing, teaching, or preaching, the wholeness of all aspects of the gospel must be presented. And that's the truth. The gospel is the foundation. It's the most important thing. I really don't care if you pray in tongues, believe in it, don't believe in it. What I do care about today is, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know where you're going to spend eternity, that's the most important thing that we're going to nail down today if you want to do that. That's, that's what's going to be the most important decision you'll ever make in this life. And then all of these other things are secondary. All these other things can be non-essential. But I do want us to understand it. That's why I taught on gifts. As a church, we need to understand what the Bible and what the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, teaches us about these gifts. And then as our band comes, these are the last scriptures today. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 33. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach. Another will tell some special revelation God has given. One will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time, and someone must interpret what they say. So if we did all that, you're not going to make the Lady Vols game.